new here. Uh, and I'm sorry about the early hours. I really should apologize for Physics 209, which was the previous course. Of course, you, uh, you, you might think you should blame that on Martin instead of me. But since I do the course assignments, I'm the one that put him in the 8 o'clock slot. So <laughs> it's really my fault. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry about the 8 o'clock hour, but uh, it, it really works out best for the uh, scheduling of, uh, of GSI assignments and things of that sort to, to do it at 8 a.m. Professors hate it as much as the students do, I think. <laughs> Um, all right, so uh, this is uh, the uh, graduate course in quantum mechanics in the physics department, uh, and uh, my name is Robert Littlejohn. Uh, my, office, uh, my office is 449 Bird, which I'll put down here also. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I want to say, first of all, that uh, if you received an email from me yesterday, it's because you were already enrolled in the course. And uh, if you read that email, you'll know that it directs you to this website, which is the website for the course. If you did not receive an email from me yesterday, then please copy down that web address and go to that website. Make sure that you can access it. Do it right away because it's important to get organized. And uh, read what's on the website because it contains the uh, organizational and logistics information about the course, things like grading policy and stuff like that, which I'm not going to go over in the, in the course in lecture. Um, so um, that'll be important. That'll be the uh, place where homework assignments will appear, all the stuff. You really need to know about that if you're going to take the course. Um, another thing is that I'm maintaining a, uh, an email mailing list for the course in which I hope to have all of your email addresses on a big long list, which I use to send you information uh, if there's some emergency or if, uh, if uh, I'm sick and can't come to come to lecture or if uh, there's an error in the homework and you need to know about it, I'll send it to you uh, on that email mailing list. So if you're, if you're taking the course, especially for credit, if you're auditing, you can sign up for this email mailing list too. I don't care. But if you're taking the course, you certainly want to be on the email mailing list. Now again, if you received the email from me yesterday, you don't need to do it because you're already on it. But if you did not receive the email, then please send an email to this address, physics221 at vigner.berkeley.edu. You, uh, and just say, please put me on the email mailing list. You could also send, use that, e that, that email address to, to ask me questions, but don't rely on it too much. I mean, don't think that an hour before the homework is due, you can send me a question and you'll get an answer because I don't you know, necessarily answer that quick. Uh, it's better to make use of the office hours and the discussion sections for that purpose. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, so please make sure you're on the email mailing list. If you drop the course and don't care anymore about the course, send me an email to that address and say, remove me and I'll take you off. All right, so that's that's all I want to say about organizational and log logistics matters. Uh, this course is a, uh, well, it's a two-semester course. Uh, the first semester 221A um, re uh, requires as a prerequisite a full year of undergraduate quantum mechanics. And if any of you have not had that, I, I, I ask you to, uh, you basically, you don't have my permission to, to take the course unless you come see me to get, to get that permission. So please do so if you haven't had a full year of undergraduate quantum mechanics. Uh, also, if you're an undergraduate, I'd like you to come ask my permission. I just need to talk to you about things because you make sure you know what you're getting yourself in for. Um, all right. Uh, the, uh, one of the purposes of 221A is to go back over this full year of quantum mechanics that you've had already and to, and to organize it in a more logical and consistent way, paying attention to fundamental principles that maybe you didn't have time for before. And, uh, and uh, that it, that's, that's part of the purpose. Part of the purpose also will be to review the material. Uh, we'll also introduce some new material in this, in this semester too. Uh, so as part of this program, I want to begin my first lecture with, for several lectures in fact, on the mathematical methods or math mathematical uh, formalism of quantum mechanics. Most of this mathematics, this won't be all the mathematics we'll cover in the semester, later on we'll have to come back and do a little more, but this is most of it in this first week. And um, the uh, mathematics mainly deals with uh, vector spaces, in particular Hilbert spaces. Um, Hilbert space is a particular kind of vector space, and you can read the official definition of a Hilbert space in math books. I won't go into that. Let me just say that Hilbert spaces are the spaces of wave functions, or let's say this, that the spaces of wave functions which occur in quantum <coughs> actually are Hilbert spaces, and so we'll call them that. 
In any case, I want to begin uh, with the mathematics of Hilbert spaces. Uh, now, uh, to, um, to get you oriented in this, let's, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call on your experience with, with, with wave functions and things like that. I assume you know quite a bit already. So to begin with, uh, and to get oriented, let's talk about wave functions in a one-dimensional problem. Let's see, I want to have the center board here. Is this the center board? Yeah, okay. So let's talk, begin by talking about a wave function psi of x in a one-dimensional problem. And uh, you know pretty much what this is. You know in particular that the square of the wave function is the probability density for making the measurements of position on the particle. Likewise, I hope you know that there's a momentum space wave function by a p, and it can be given by uh, what's essentially a Fourier transform of the position, position or configuration space wave function, as it's called at the top, uh, e to the minus ipx over h bar psi of x. And this also has a square of phi of p, absolute value squared, uh, which uh, represents physically the probability density for in momentum space for making measurements of position, uh, excuse me, measurements of momentum. Now, uh, some, so there's only two wave functions, psi of x and phi of p. And they're related to one another by invertible transformations. It's really a Fourier transform. Um, now, uh, let's suppose in addition that we've got some uh, energy eigenfunctions. Let's say we call them u n of x is equal to e n u n of x for some problem. And let's suppose that they're discrete and non-degenerate eigenfunctions for simplicity. Then you know you can take an arbitrary wave function psi of x and, and write it as a linear combination with expansion coefficients I'll call cn <coughs> times the energy eigenfunctions. And you know that the expansion coefficients are given by an integral over x, which is uh, un of x complex conjugated uh, times a psi of x. These are linear transformations that convert you back and forth between the psi and the coefficient c's. Well, these coefficient c's form a sequence. Let's call it c1, c2, dot, 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 like this. And this sequence of coefficients can be thought of as, quote, unquote, the, the wave function in energy space. Yeah. Position space, momentum space, energy space. There are three different types of wave functions. Moreover, the square of these coefficients, c and squared, I hope you know, this is uh, interpreted as the probability of making a measurement uh, when you make a measurement of energy, it's the probability of getting the eigenvalue en, uh, which is associated with that, that coefficient. So these are, the, so what we have here actually are, these can be thought of as three different wave functions which describe the same physical system, the same, same state of the physical system. And from a certain point of view, these are all equivalent descriptions. Uh, this is certainly true from the mathematical point of view because uh, everything that one, all the questions that one wants to ask in a physical sense about a, a quantum system, it ultimately boils down to probabilities of making measurements. All of these calculations can be done in any one of these three uh, wave functions, or as we say, representations, position, momentum, and energy representation of the wave function. And so from this strictly mathematical standpoint, there's no reason to think that any one of these wave functions is privileged or special over any of the others. Now, there's a psychological bias in thinking that the psi of x wave function is the privileged one, that it's better than the others somehow, or that it's a starting point. Why is this so? Uh, it's uh, partly because we're used to thinking about wave functions in physical space, or functions, scalar fields, field scalar vector fields in physical space, electric fields, pressures, uh, pressure of fluids, and things of that sort, things that we can measure in physical space. And so why isn't psi like that? Well, when Schrodinger was starting to write down the Schrodinger equation, that's how we thought of psi, as a physical field in physical space. However, it's pretty clear that, that can't, that's actually an interpretation that doesn't hold up. Because physical space is not the same as configuration space. Configuration space is basically x space. Why? Not in general it's not. Why? Because you may have a wave function for two particles, in which case the wave function depends on the positions of both particles. So it's not a wave function on physical space, it's really a wave function on two copies of physical space. Configuration space, you see, is not the same as physical space. So that's one difference. Another difference is that if you get down to actually thinking about measuring a wave function psi of x, let's say for a single particle, let's go back to that so you have just a single particle on physical space, think about measuring that, we'll talk about that later in the course, you'll find out the measurement process is really very different from the kind of measurements you would make of an electric field or a pressure in a fluid, where you, in principle you can just go to a point and measure it. 
measure the number. It's not so simple with psi. Certainly, it's not hard to measure the square of psi. In principle, it's not hard because it's a probability density. Make repeated measurements and just count how many particles lie in a small interval. That gives you the probability. But finding the phase of the wave function is a different matter and is much more subtle. There's all kinds of subtleties that don't occur in the measurements of classical fields. So, for many reasons, uh, it's best not to think of psi of x as being defined in physical space, but rather on this x space or, or, or configuration space. All right. Now, uh, so with that background in mind, then, uh, it's desirable in developing the formalism of quantum mechanics to use a notation which does not prejudice the choice amongst these observables. By the way, clearly these, these excuse me, these wave functions, clearly these observables are associated with, clearly these wave functions, these three wave functions, are associated with three different observables, position, momentum, energy in this case, and one can come up with other observables, <coughs> angular momentum, and anything else you want to measure, and each one of them has its own wave function. And these are all equivalent, but it's equivalent descriptions of the same reality, the same quantum reality. So, in view of this democracy or covariance of quantum mechanics under changes of what we call representation, position, momentum, energy representation, and others, this is a, this covariance principles were worked out in the very early days of quantum mechanics by notably von Neumann, but others, Dirac, and so on. In view of this covariance amongst these different descriptions, it's desirable to have a notation for uh, describing the states of systems that doesn't prejudice the choice. And so that's what the Dirac notation does, and that's what I want to, uh, to uh, tell you about now. So in the Dirac notation, we speak of uh, kets, or also called ket vectors, because they are vectors. And a ket is denoted by this kind of notation, like this. And uh, it stands, supposed to stand for any one of those wave functions up there. Uh, and it's uh, customary to, in, in to insert into a ket vector a an identifying symbol, such as psi. I'll put a psi in there. It doesn't mean that it stands for psi of x. It really stands for all of those wave functions. Uh, but it's an identifying symbol of the ket. And a ket vector belongs to a vector space, which I'll denote by script E like this. It's a complex vector space, which is called the Hilbert space. And uh, uh, as I say, I won't uh, bother you with the official mathematical definition of a Hilbert space, although there is one. Uh, but rather, just let's make the remark that Hilbert spaces are, in quantum mechanics, are the spaces of wave functions. And, uh, and uh, that'll be enough for us. That's how we we'll use the terminology. Anyway, it's a, it's a ket vector in this space. Uh, now then, uh, just to say a few words about the physical postulates of quantum mechanics, we'll get into this in more detail in, a, in, a, in about a week. Uh, the physical postulates of quantum mechanics assert, in the formulation I'll present in this course, they assert that uh, corresponding to every physical system, there is a vector space, in fact, a Hilbert's complex vector space, a Hilbert space, which is associated with a system. And it gives ways of, of knowing what the Hilbert space is based on the kind of measurements you can make on the system. We'll go into this in more detail later on. But in particular, there's physical principles that tell you what the dimensionality of the space should be. You'll find, for example, for spin systems, the space is finite dimensional. And for systems that include a position variable, it's an infinite dimensional. In any case, Hilbert space is maybe infinite dimensional. Uh, to say that this is a complex vector space means that, mathematically speaking, you can form linear combinations of vectors with complex coefficients. That's what a complex vector space means. A real vector space means you're restricted to real coefficients when you make linear combinations. So in particular, it means that it's meaningful to talk about linear combinations of uh, ket vectors like this, psi with c1, psi1 plus c2, psi2. This is supposed to also belong to the, to the to the Hilbert space E, where C1 and C2 are complex numbers. I'll write this by saying that it belong to the complexes using this mathematical symbol for the complex numbers. All right. Now, um, you, crudely speaking, this is a similar to the idea of linear superposition of electric fields in phys physical space. But remember, the wave function really isn't in physical space, so this is something else. But it is certainly linear superposition of vectors Moreover, there's complex coefficients, and you might ask, why do we need complex numbers? Why can't we do it with just real numbers? 
Uh, we'll see later on when we study spin systems that it's impossible to do it. You can't satisfy the uh, physical postulates of quantum mechanics with only real numbers. Um, okay. Now, um, people that study chemistry sometimes kind of take courses in chemistry, they lose this because most of the problems in chemistry involve only real wave functions, so they have real coefficients. But actually, they have to be, they have to be complex. All right. Uh, all right, so this is the beginnings of the Ket notation and the, and the Ket vectors. Uh, by the way, the physical postulates that I'll say, let's speak about later on describe how the, the physical state of the system can be associated with a, with a given Ket vector. I'll just say one thing about that now, however, which is that a physical state is actually not associated with a Ket vector, uh, but rather it's associated with what you call a ray. It's associated with a ray in the over space E. Uh, what a ray is, is it's not just a single <coughs> vector. If you take the origin of the vector space, call it O, and I draw a vector here, like what, this is our, our vector, cut vector psi. What the ray is, is it's a set of all vectors that can be obtained by multiplying psi by any complex number. You can think of it as being all the vectors that lie in a one-dimensional subspace where the, the magnitude is scaled, also the phase factors get scaled. The ray is a, is a ket vector uh, to a, uh, it's, it's a ket vector, but it's a ket vector, let's put it this way, it's a state is a ket vector modulo the overall normalization of the phase, which don't have any physical significance. So the physical state is independent of normalization of phase. So in any case, the physical state corresponds to a whole ray, one dimensional subspace of the, of the vector space. All right, so that's a little bit about ket vectors. <coughs> now, um, you're no doubt roughly familiar with the idea that cat like psi are somehow supposed to correspond to wave functions psi of x. That's the idea. Uh, I'll, uh, before I go into that, I, I want to say that the, that, the, that, the, that the program I'm trying to follow here is to start with the physical postulates of quantum mechanics, which lead to cat vectors. We won't talk about wave functions. In effect, what I'm going to do is develop mathematics of cat spaces and then later derive them derive wave functions from the physical postulates. Uh, so I won't talk about wave functions at first, except to, for purposes of illustration, as I did up above, up here, because you know about wave functions already. But nevertheless, behind the scenes, we're thinking of cat spaces as wave function spaces. And I'm sure you know that cats are supposed to correspond somehow to wave functions. And I suppose you also know that, that bras that look like this are supposed to correspond to the complex conjugates of wave functions. Now, so I want to introduce the subject of bras now. The uh, question here is, is um, how do we, if I don't talk about wave functions, how can I talk about a bra which is supposed to be a complex conjugate? The answer is the following. As we say that a, a bra, or a bra vector, because it, a bra also is a member of a vector space, this first of all is the notation. It's given in direct notation like this, with a kind of a reverse, uh, kind of a it's reverse of a ket. And as in the case of a ket, it's convenient to put in an identifying symbol for the bra just to identify it or label it, distinguish it from other bras. And what is a ket? What is a bra vector? It is a bra vector is a map it's described this way. This is it's a linear map as a matter of fact. It takes us from the ket space over to the complex numbers. And what that means is, is that if I have a bra, which I call alpha like this, it's something that can act on cats like this. And what does it pr produce? It produces a complex number. And you can write it like this way if you want. But we usually don't write it that way because it's too many parentheses. We usually just drop the parentheses and write it this way as alpha psi. <coughs> So this is just the value of the linear map alpha acting on the ket vector psi. All right. Now, and then I guess I did do this wrong because I'm supposed to do another point. Just all right. Let's do it this way. Let's see. <coughs> now. Um, 
it's pretty easy to see that the that the bras as linear operators. Now, by the way, you're used to linear operators like Hamiltonian and the momentum and so on operators in quantum mechanics. Bras are not operators like that. Those usual operators like Hamiltonians in quantum mechanics are, are operators that act on the kets and what they produce is another ket. They map kets and kets into kets. A bra is, is a linear operator that maps kets into complex numbers. It's a complex value linear operator. It's kind of a simpler linear operator, actually. Right. Now, uh, now, uh, Bra vectors form their own vector space. If you take the set of all bras like this, it's formed its own vector space. It's easy to see how to multiply uh, bras by scalars. You just multiply the answer by a scalar. Uh, and it's easy to see how to take linear combinations of bras. You just add up the answers for the different bras. So I'll, I'll to be explicit about this. C1 alpha 1 plus C2 alpha 2 is a linear combination of the bras. And if we allow this to add up again, the answer is C1 alpha 1 psi plus C2 alpha 2 psi. And so it's an, this, is a, this thing in the parentheses is another bra. So, uh, so indeed, they form a vector space. And the set of bras like this is sometimes called the dual space to the original cat space. And it's done it this, I'll do it this way with an E star on a star indicating that it's a space of bras instead of a space of cats. You know, if you were doing wave functions, you would say, oh, this is a complex conjugate wave function, just a wave function, so it belongs to the same space as the original space of wave functions. That's a, that's a simple point of view. But in fact, it's more, it, it turns out it is deeper and more uh, convenient, ultimately, to uh, regard this as a separate space, which we call the dual space. All right. Now, um, this still doesn't tell me, uh, this still doesn't tell us what's the analog of the complex conjugation operation. How do we complex conjugate a cat? Well, we don't complex conjugate cats, but you do something similar, and it works like this. It relies on the fact that, uh, that, that the cat spaces, that's to say Hilbert spaces, possess a scalar product, a way of taking scalar products of vectors. And uh, this is related to the metric, which I'll tell you about now. The metric is a function, which I'll call g. And what it does is it takes two copies of the cat space and maps it into the complex numbers. This is math notation. If you're not used to it, what it means simply is that g acts on two cats, which maybe I'll call psi and phi. And what it produces is a, it's a complex number. Like this. Acts on a pair of vectors. And this metric g is supposed to have certain properties, which I'll try to list here in case I, in case I run out, run out of space. Properties of the first first property is there's really there's really two properties at first. Uh, one is is that call it one a is that g is linear in the second operand which I'm calling phi here. So what that means is, is that if you let g act on psi comma phi, let's put it this way, linear combination c1 phi one plus c2 phi two. If we let it act on a linear combination combination in the second slot, replace that by linear combination, then you can set it out just by linearity. So this becomes C1 G acting on the side, comma phi one plus C2 G acting on side comma phi two, like this. That's the linearity. 1b is the second property, which is that it's anti-linear in the first operand. And I'll tell you now what anti-linear means. It is if I replace the first operand by a linear combination, let's do only the second row alone, then we have g of, let's say, c1 psi 1 plus c2 psi 2 comma phi. What is that equal to? Well, it's equal to C1 complex conjugate times G acting on psi 1 comma phi plus C2 complex conjugate G acting on psi 2 
The term antilinear, which we'll encounter, encounter once in a while in this course, means that when you apply something to a linear combination of where, where you have expansion with, with, with co complex numbers, it's coefficients. And when you expand it out, you have to take the complex conjugates of the coefficients. Anyway, G is, is linear in the second operand and anti-linear in the first. So those are two properties of it. Let me try to see if I can put the other properties over here. Uh, there is a second property, which let's call a symmetry property of G. And the symmetry property says that if I take G of psi phi, a pair of, a pair of cats, the answer is G of phi psi in the reverse order which is a complex number, but I have to complex conjugate it. This is the symmetry property. And the third property is called the positive definite property. And it says this, is that if I take G and let it act on two cats which are identical, the same cat in both slots, well, first of all, before I write anything out, notice that by the property number two, the answer has to be real because it's equal to its own complex conjugate. Mm -hmm. So this is a real number. And in fact, it turns out it's always a positive, or, or it's a positive number or zero. This is for all psi, for all states psi, in the Hilbert space. And it equals zero if and only if the state psi is equal to zero. It vanishes the G value of uh, symmetric with, with the G with the same vector inserted in both slots is equal to zero if and only if the vector is zero. All right, so those are the three properties of the metric. The metric in a real vector space is a way of doing dot products of vectors, and in particular, the metric, you take, the, you take the scalar product of a vector with itself, you get the square of the length. That's how it is in a real vector space with a Euclidean metric. It would satisfy the real analog of these three properties. So roughly speaking, this g of psi psi here, which is a positive number, is interpreted also in quantum mechanics as the length of the of the ket psi. Length, quote unquote, it's a geometrical analogy or metaphor for thinking about the geometry of these complex spaces. formalism and then later we'll derive wave functions from it. Uh, not treating wave functions as the starting point. Um, uh, yes, all right. Now, uh, next I need to tell you about something which in Sakurai's book is called a dual correspondence. Actually, it's a fancy language for permission conjugation, which you know about already, but I'll tell you how it works. Uh, the idea is this, is let's, let's consider the metric uh, acting on two cats. This is, a, like I say, can be interpreted as a scalar product of the two cats. Let's consider this metric acting on two cats. And um, the, uh, let's regard the first one as being fixed and the second one as being variable. So. Then we, this can be regarded in a fact as a function of just a single cat, the phi cat. And moreover, it's linear in the in phi cat because that's the second operand. And it is a complex value. So this is a complex value linear operator acting on cats phi. And so by, by our definition of a bra, it's actually a bra vector, or a bra acting on phi. So this is some bra acting on on phi by the definition of a bra. And what is the bra? Well, the bra is, it is a linear operator, but clearly it's a linear operator. It's associated with the psi here that we fixed. So what we do is we write this this way. This is the definition now. We write this as the definition of psi phi. That's to say this is the definition of bra psi. We started given a ket psi, and this, is, this associates it with the bra psi. So what this formula does is it defines a, a, a mapping that takes us from a ket psi 
This is called what Sakurai calls this is a dual correspondence. He takes this over to a draw side. The definition of a dual correspondence is this formula. And in fact, after a while, we'll stop using the G notation. We'll end up just writing it this way. It means the same thing. All right. But instead of using DC, there's a, there's, a, there's a more common notation, which is to use the dagger notation. That's to say the answer, which is the bra here. And we'll say that this is the cat side with a dagger on it. The dagger is remission conjugation, which uh, is here being defined in its action on ket vectors. And what it does is it converts ket vectors into bra vectors, <coughs> uh, which uh, are defined by the formula at the top. And um, this uh, dual correspondence, if you like, you see, is a mapping that takes you from the ket space over to the dual space, the E star. Did I mention that before, that the dual space E star is the space of bras? So it maps you from kets to bras. Uh, if you're working on a, a, a space of finite dimensions, uh, and you, you have these postulates of the, of the metric G, it's easy to show that the dual correspondence is invertible. The dimension of the bra space is the same as that of the ket space. And moreover, every bra, which is created in this, or every bra, in fact, is the image of some ket under this dagger operation. So the kets and the bras are placed into one-to-one -one correspondence. And therefore, it has an inverse, uh, so that you can do a DC inverse that takes you from uh, bras back to kets. And this inverse is, uh, is uh, uh, traditionally noted, denoted also by the same dagger notation. So what we get is, is uh, this, is we can say that if I have a, a, a ket side, and there's a bra side that I get by applying the inverse of the dual co correspondence, I just use the same dagger notation for it. It isn't really the same operator. It's really the inverse of it. But it's, uh, the notation doesn't cause any trouble, because if you square it, you get the identity. You see, it's a consequence of this that if I take side and dagger it twice, I just get side back again. So in effect, we define the dagger notation now in both cats and bras, and it just amounts to switching one back and forth into the other. All right. The dual correspondence is anti-linear. If I take a linear combination of cats, and I form the dagger of it, what I get is C1 star, bra psi 1, plus C2 star, bra psi 2. This follows just from the fact that, that the G operator is anti-linear in the first operand. That's what makes it an anti-linear operation, the, um, the dual correspondence. Um, a consequence of, of this structure that I've developed so far is the Schwartz inequality, which I'll tell you about now. The Schwartz inequality is uh, important in quantum mechanics because it leads to the Heisenberg uncertainty relations, as we'll see a little later. Uh, if you uh, apply the Schwartz inequality on a real vector space, you'll find that it's equivalent to the statement that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And in some sense, even in complex vector spaces, you can think of that as being the geometrical meaning of the Schwartz inequality. But in any case, here's how it's stated. The Schwartz inequality says that if you take the scalar product of, of a phi with a psi, that's a complex number, and you take its absolute value squared, if this is less than or equal to the scalar product of phi with itself times psi with itself. Both those numbers on the right-hand side are real and positive, so they're product is real and positive, and the statement is, is that the scalar product is, is less than the product of the, of the squares of the two vectors. We can, think of the, we can think of size size being the square of the vector psi, the real number, a real, real and non-negative number. Uh, so uh, I won't use the Schwartz inequality yet, but at least let me prove it. It works like this. Uh, oh, and by the way, there's an addition to this too, which is that we get equals but instead, of a, instead of an inequality, it turns into an equal sign if and only if the cats psi and phi are linearly dependent.
So that's the short thing to it. The proof, which I'll outline quickly, runs something like this, is let's define a, a cat alpha, which is equal to psi, plus a complex number lambda times the cat phi. We'll take a linear combination of the two cats, in other words. And uh, we form the scalar product of alpha with itself, which, as you can see, is going to be psi scalar product of psi, plus lambda times psi scalar product of phi, plus lambda complex conjugated times phi scalar product of psi, plus the absolute value of lambda squared times phi scalar product with phi itself, like this. And because this is the scalar product of a ket with itself, the result has to be greater than or equal to zero by postulate number uh, number uh, two. Uh, or is it? I can't read it here. It's, uh, it's number three, isn't it? It's number three, yes. And postulate number three, this is uh, greater, than, greater than or equal to zero. Now, lambda is any complex number here, and it turns out, if you play with this for a while, that an interesting choice is to let lambda be equal to minus the scalar product of phi with psi divided by the scalar product of phi with itself. And I'll let you do the algebra. If you plug this in to these four terms here, what you find is, is that the last three terms are all equal except the middle two ones have got a minus sign on them, so it goes minus one, minus one, plus one. And the result is this, is that alpha scalar product with alpha is equal to scalar product of psi with itself minus the absolute value of phi scalar product of psi squared divided by phi scalar product of phi. This is greater than or equal to zero. And just by multiplying through by this positive number here, you see you get the Schwartz inequality up above in the first form. There's a little extra work to do to show the second form that you get an equal sign if and only if they're linearly uh, dependent, and I'll let you refer to the notes to see how that works out. Okay. So that's a result that we put here because it's something we can derive at this point. Now, uh, next, uh, let me move on and say something about linear operators. Uh, and I don't want to call this. How do I even access this backboard? How do you do it? I don't get one of the other. That's the reason I can't use that third board. I thought you'd be able, supposed to be able to raise two of them at once, but apparently you are. One goes down, the other comes up. Okay, well, I'll just have to alternate back and forth. Next, I want to say something about linear operators in quantum mechanics. Here I'm referring to the kinds of things like energy, momentum, and Hamiltonians, which you are familiar with. So a linear operator is a, is a, is a mapping that takes us from the text space to itself, and it's supposed to be linear, so that it has the obvious distributed law over linear combinations of, of ket vectors. It's also possible to talk about antilinear operators where you need to take a complex conjugation, a complex conjugate of the coefficients when you have linear combinations. I'm not going to say much about antilinear operators now because uh, most of the operators we deal with are linear. There is one important antilinear operator in quantum mechanics, which is time reversal, and we'll cover that later in the course. But don't worry about the antilinear operators when we get to them. And so for now, let's just talk about linear operators, which covers most of the cases. Hamiltonians, et cetera, are, are linear operators. Now, uh, one of the things to say about linear operators, if you've got one, is that you, linear operator acts on cats. That's where they, that's where they begin life. Uh, can we also talk about linear operators acting on bras? Is this possible? I mean, if we do, it isn't really the same operator, but I'll call it that anyway. Is, can we define this? And the answer is yes, it works like this. So the idea is that if I have L acting on psi, that this is defined because L is a linear operator acting on cats. And what I'd like to do now is to say, what is this if I let the linear op operator act on a bra? What's the meaning of that? Well, if the linear operator acts on a bra, it's supposed to produce another bra. So this thing, psi L, is a bra. And therefore, it's a, it's a linear map uh, that, act, that, that takes cats into complex numbers. 
And so therefore, I should be able to let this thing act on a cat phi, and I should get a complex number. And in fact, I can define this bra if I just say what the complex number is and verify that it's in fact linear. That's the things I need to do. Well, here's a simple answer. The complex number is going to be this. It's going to be the bra psi acting on the cat L phi. Because remember, we know what L does to cats. So this, this equation, in effect, becomes a definition of psi L. So I'll make this three arrow, three little the triple equal sign here because that means definition. It doesn't mean that here. Uh, so this is a definition of this gives us a definition of psi acting on 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 uh, uh, on uh, of psi L of L acting on psi from as we say it acts from from the right onto a bra. We say here it acts from the left onto a cat. Now one of the consequences of this definition is that the parentheses don't matter. So it's customary to drop them and just to write this this way as psi L phi. But lying behind this is the understanding that you can let L act either to the right or to the left, and it won't make any difference in the answer. So this is what you call a matrix element of the operator L, linear operator L. Uh, tell you now about the outer product. Let's suppose we're given uh, two cats, which I'll call alpha and beta. You don't have to use Greek indices for cats, but I'm Greek labels, but I'm doing that mostly here. Suppose I'm given two cats, alpha and beta. Then I want to define uh, a linear operator, which is called the outer product of alpha and beta, which is written this way as alpha beta. It looks like a cat just opposed, juxtaposed with a bra. So this is a linear operator, supposed to be a linear operator. And it's called the outer product. Well, I already said that, so let's say it again. It's called the outer product of, of cats alpha and beta. And uh, how do we define it? Well, if it's a linear operator, it means we can let it act on any cat, and we should get another cat. And what will the answer be? It will be this. It will be cat alpha times the scalar product of, of beta with psi. In other words, you can say the definition of the outer product amounts to just reading the, these three symbols juxtaposed with a different ordering of parentheses. You do it like this, or you do it like this. On the right-hand side, you see this now becomes a complex number multiplying times a ket. On the left-hand side, it's an operator acting on psi. And this defines the operator. This is the definition of it. So that's the outer product. The other product is, is uh, essentially the same as what people call the tensor product or dyadic product. If you ever study tensor analysis, that's what they, they uh, call it. Now I want to say, say a little bit about basis vectors. You know from linear algebra that a basis is a set of vectors that span the space. And that means that they're, uh, well, they span the space and they're also linearly independent. So of linearly independent vectors that span the space. So in a ket space, let's suppose for simplicity that we talk about a discrete basis. So we've got a set of ket vectors I'll call n, where n index is indexed by 1, 2, 3, something like this. And the number of such vectors is the dimensionality of the space, which could be infinite because ket spaces are oftentimes infinite dimensional. Uh, the basis may or may not be orthonormal. Uh, bases don't have to be orthonormal. Usually, in quantum, usually, but not always, in quantum mechanics, we use orthonormal bases. So we said the basis is orthonormal, as I'm sure you know, if the scalar product of a pair of basis vectors is prime for delta like this, they're the most useful bases in quantum mechanics. So let's let's talk about those with normal bases. Then, if I have an arbitrary uh, cat, or as we say, state psi, uh, because
gives us the basis, that means I can expand this as a linear combination with some coefficients of the basis cats. And by the orthonormality relation, it follows immediately that its expansion coefficients are just given by the scalar product of the basis cats with the original vector psi, like this. I'm sure you're familiar with this sort of thing. Now, in this expansion, I've got a complex number multiplied times a cat. Uh, when we write that, we can also put the complex number on the other side. It doesn't matter which side you put the complex number on when you multiply a complex number times a cat. But I'll put it over here on the other side because now what I want to do is take the expansion coefficient and plug it in here. And if you do that, then you get the sum on n of n cat n bra psi like this. So read one way, this is cat n times a complex number. But we can read it another way, which is outer product of n n acting on cat psi like this. In fact, let me move the parentheses like this because psi itself doesn't depend on n. And so what you see is, is that there's an operator which is in these parentheses here. And when it acts on an arbitrary cat, it reproduces the same cat all over again. And therefore, that operator must be the identity. And so we say, we write it this way, is that the sum of the outer product of the basis cats with themselves is equal to 1, where 1 stands for the identity operator. It's common, common in quantum mechanics to write the identity operator as just 1. Um, and this is called resolution of the identity, which is associated with the basis here, assumed to be a discrete basis. Later on, we'll generalize this to the case of, of continuous bases, but this is what it looks like. So this is a, an example of where the outer product appears is in a resolution of the identity. All right. Now, another topic. Uh, I previously defined uh, the dagger operation on cats, which maps them into bras, and the dagger operation on bras, which maps them into cats. Dagger operation is permission conjugation. It's convenient to extend the definition of the dagger operation to complex numbers, in which case it's just interpreted as complex conjugation, same thing as complex conjugation. Now I want to extend this even further to define the complex, define the Hermitian conjugate of an operator. Here's the idea. If I have a linear operator A, this is a linear mapping of the Kent space into itself, I want to define the Hermitian conjugate of A, which will be another linear operator on the same Kent space. And the question is how to define this. And the answer is, is the following, is that we say a dagger acting on psi is equal to, we first take the cat psi, convert it into a bra using the dual correspondence. You then let the operator A act on that. We know how, to, we know how, how, how often linear operators act on bras. And then we take the whole thing and initially conjugate it again. This is the definition of a dagger. Now, the question that arises is that if A is linear, is A dagger also linear? And the answer is yes, because you see, when I first take psi and then I convert it into a bra by the dual correspondence, that's actually any linear operation. And then I'm going to let A act on the bra. But then I permission conjugate a second time, which is another any linear operation. And so the result turns into a linear operator. So A dagger is linear, linear operator. All right, so this is the definition. Right. Now, there's a whole bunch of simple consequences of this definition, which I'll just list out here. Uh, let's see. So one of them is, is that if I take A and dagger it twice, I get A back all over again. That certainly applies in these other instances of the permission conjugate operation. 
Another property is that if you take the product of two operators and you dagger them, you get the, the daggered operators in the reverse order. You have to reverse it. The third property is that if I take a matrix element of an operator A between two states, psi and phi, uh, this is equal to, well, perhaps I'll write it this way. Let's take the complex conjugate of that matrix element. This is equal to the original original matrix element, but read in the reverse order, where everything is daggered as you move through it. So we start at the right at phi, cat phi, we dagger it, turn it into a bra. The operator A gets turned into A dagger, and cat psi gets turned into excuse me, bra psi gets turned into cat. Just reverse the order of this. Here's another consequence of it: if I take the outer product of two cats alpha and beta, and I dagger that, this is a linear operator, so I'll dagger it. What this turns into is the outer product of the two cats in the reverse order. These are all easy consequences of the definition. Now, one result of these definitions is a general rule in quantum mechanics whenever you're dealing with cats, draws, linear operators, complex numbers, all multiplied together. Uh, the kind of multiplication can be ordinary multiplication. It can be operator act, operators acting either to the right or the left, or it can be the tensor product of, of two cats. All it has to be is just a meaningful expression. The rule is that if you want to take the emission conjugate of that, you read the expression backwards and you apply dagger to each, each item separately. Complex numbers go into their complex conjugate and so on. And in fact, there's a couple of examples of that rule right here. You see this has been read backwards. This is the this star is the complex conjugation for the whole result, which is the uh, complex number, the matrix element. Here you're reading it backwards and daggering things, reading it backwards and daggering. The rule applies quite generally. This is all this is all part of the um, of the neatness or the advantage of the Dirac notation for calculations of quantum mechanics is that it makes all these operations uh, quite natural in the notation. All right. <coughs> Now, um, as I'm sure you know, a, to make another definition, I'm sure you know that Hermitian operator A is one which is equal to its own Hermitian conjugate, <coughs> definition of Hermitian operator. Um, Hermitian operators are uh, related to operators, what are called self-adjoint operators. If you're a mathematician, you go to great troubles to draw the distinction between these and to be aware of when there's one is the same and the other was uh, and, the, and when the two are the same and when they aren't. Uh, but for practical applications in quantum mechanics, we can consider self-adjoint and Hermitian as being essentially synonymous. Um, if this worries you about it, you need to go study a course on functional analysis. I'll just put it that way. Uh, actually, in finite dimensions, in a finite dimensional space, the two, term, the two terms, emission and, 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 and self-adjoint, are equivalent. The only issue arises in infinite dimensional spaces, and uh, I don't really want to get into the mathematics of the technicalities of infinite dimensional spaces very much in this course. But in any case, it, 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 for, for most practical purposes, we can regard these two terms as synonymous. All right. Now, um, if you have Hermitian operators, Hermitian operators, of course, I'm sure you know this, are particularly important because they represent physical observables. We'll gradually say more about why this is true as, as we go on. But right now, let me uh, let me just say I'm going to say one more thing here. Yeah, let me just say one more thing here. Is that we say that Hermitian operator is positive definite. Let me write this out. A uh, Hermitian operator is said to be positive definite. If you have this following property, is that if you form the matrix element of your operator A with the same state on both sides, then the answer is always non-negative. And furthermore, if you get equals to zero if and only if the same side vanishes. This is a definition of positive definite. A positive definite operator, uh, from another point of view, is an operator whose eigenvalues are all uh, positive. Uh, one can also speak of a non-negative definite operator, and that's one whose eigenvalues may include zeros, but they don't include any negative numbers. Um, 
And uh, I haven't said anything about eigenvalues yet, uh, but I will. Uh, I guess in the next lecture, we'll talk about uh, the eigenvalues, eigen, you know, the spectrum of operators and things of that sort. Okay, that's all for today.